we provide need it most. Today's presentation covers an extremely important topic, which is staying safe around downed electrical lines, but we'll also go over a few details concerning your daily exposure to electrical hazards, which are much more likely to be the cause of an injury or even death. Electrical safety is always important, but after a severe storm or any type of mishap, the chances of you being seriously injured or killed by downed power lines increase dramatically. Today you're going to learn how you can reduce those chances and how to be smart about electrical safety. You'll also see some specific examples of exactly what not to do, and you can benefit from the mistakes that others have made before. We're extremely fortunate today to have as our guest Warren Rogers, Safety Supervisor for Connecticut Light and Power. Warren is a veteran speaker. He's a respected expert on the topic of electrical safety, and his presentations are in constant demand because of their educational value. You'll definitely see that today. He distills this extremely important information into a very easy to understand presentation, and he even manages to make it a little funny. Can't beat that. <laughs> Warren has a long history in the commercial and U.S. Navy nuclear industries in radiation protection, emergency management, and training. For the last 10 years, he's been involved with electric distribution safety for Connecticut Light and Power. As a sideline, Warren teaches 40 to 50 electrical safety and emergency response training classes a year, about half of those as a volunteer, to first responders, public works employees, CERT teams, and occasionally to OSHA associates. Warren holds a BS in Applied Science in Radiation Protection from Charter Oak State University and an MS in Emergency Management from Jacksonville State University. Warren, thank you so much for joining this morning. We'll turn it over to you now. Okay, very good. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. And I hope in the next uh, few minutes I can make you very, very smart about what's out there on those poles and wires and on the ground. And if we can make you smart, I can, it can keep you alive. I can keep you safe. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to learn how to be smart. If we're smart, we're safe. So let's start out. Now, even though I, I titled this in the before math and after math, this most of your, your, your exposure to electricity is going to be before the storm pass. There can be some after, so we're going to talk about both, all right? I don't want you being like this, 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 this family here on the street. You can see that there's a small tree that fell in the background there, and it knocks the stuff down, knocks the pole down, knocks the wires. Knock, they have no clue what they're looking at. That makes it very dangerous for them. There's four people. There's feet over to the left, you can see, and th this is a very dangerous situation. has no clue what she's looking at. And I guarantee you, that's a 90 volt 15 amp battery UPS system that was supposed to be up on the pole about 15 feet. Now it's on the ground, so that means it's safe to go over and check it out, right? No, it's absolutely not. So we're going to be smarter than this when we get through. You've got to understand where electricity is coming from. Electricity has got to come from a generating place, get to your house, go through your stuff, and go back in order for everything to work. It's got to complete a circuit. And it's got to complete a circuit and go back to ground. And that's why it's got to, it's, it's, that's what's going on. It is a very simple thing. We're not going to go through the high school stuff there, but it's got to make a complete circuit. And in order for a circuit to function, it has to be going back to ground. So just hold that thought for a minute, because we're going to talk about that. Any utility move, moving electricity through from point A to point B to the customers has got to use some type of conductors. And these are just samples. These are scrap pieces we've got piled up in the back of one of our utility locations our, where our trucks are. And in case we just need a short piece, we've got a, a stockpile of that. All of we got copper. We've got uh, aluminum. We've got uh, some overhead wire. We've got some of the risk stuff with the red stripe is underground. If you're ever digging in your yard, you've got underground services, and you're digging, and you see a black hose with a red stripe on it, stop what you're doing and call the utility. If you haven't done a call before, you you dig, you're looking at primary voltage, you're looking at high voltage stuff there. So that, 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 that strike means a whole lot. So we use these because they're very, very good conductors. And they move electricity well. They're reasonably priced. Well, copper is not anymore. But the rest of it is. But the absolute best conductor of electricity is you. You are, are so much water, so much salt, so much chemicals, that any time electricity is trying to do that complete circuit to go to ground, through the normal path that we've got designed, when the human being gets in the middle of that, it goes through you because it's going to take the path of least resistance. It always will take the path of least resistance, and that's always going to be you if you get yourself in the middle of it. So that's what we've got to avoid, being part of that path to ground, path that, that path back to the, the circuit trying to complete go to ground. We don't want it to be the human. So where are we in this big food chain? 
So we start out here, we got the power plant. The power plant makes it a low voltage, 24K of typically, and it's going to step it up and get it in the transmission. To move it, it's going to step it up to what we call a, a transmission voltage. In, in, in Connecticut, that, that could be up to 345,000 volts. You get out west, you can go to 500, you can see some 700 stuff. You see, but if you see the big towers, that's just transmission voltage. Now, when a utility needs some power, they drop it out of the transmission and they put it into a substation. The substation is where we step it down from transmission to what we call primary voltage. Primary voltage or distribution voltage is always going to be the wires on top of the pole. That is going to be the highest voltage wires on any pole. From here to Hawaii, that's going to be the configuration. The highest voltage is going to be on top of that pole. It comes down in distribution voltage. Oh, eventually you get to a customer. The customer typically doesn't want whatever that primary voltage is. In Connecticut, ours can be as high as 23,000 volts. So the utilities are, can vary on that. But ours, 23,000 volts. Customer never wants 23,000 volts because the hot tub runs just a little too fast on that. So we step it down. We step it down with a transformer. And this could be a pole top or a pad mount transformer. We step down the primary voltage to what we call secondary voltage. Secondary voltage is always the same voltage. It's usually a 120 and a 120, two hot legs, and a bare neutral. And that's what goes to the customer. So that's where we are. The substation, I want to save you a trip to your local substation. Very, very dangerous locations. You never want to go to these things. You never want to let your kids go into these things. I'm trying to save you a trip. If you can tell, we're just giving, being very subtle about it. We don't want you going in this thing. If you can, if you, in fact, if you can read this, you're too close. So. I'm, I'm saving you a trip. Very dangerous locations. Now, a substation. Here's where all the fun starts. Here we've got a transmission feed coming in, drops into the substation. The substation equipment steps it down from transmission voltage to distribution voltage. In this case, we're bringing it underground, and we're bringing it up the side of a pole, and this is the beginning of a uniquely numbered, uniquely named circuit that's going to go out and feed thousands of customers, but it originated at the substation. Now, this thing on the side here, this riser, very, very important. All of you start looking for these. If you see a plastic PVC pipe or a pipe on the side of that pole, that is typically how the utilities get primary voltage conductors from the top of the pole to the bottom of the pole. So if you're ever weed packing or backing into something, you've got a snow plow, and you damage one of these things, or if you've got a vehicle that's hit one of these things, you have got an electrical event, and you've got to take the right actions. We're going to talk about those actions in a few minutes. But look for those things. They're everywhere. And that's how we get primary voltage conductors up and down the poles in those PVC pipes. There's what we call primary, overhead primary. That's three phase. Each wire is referred to as a phase, and that is what we call a three phase primary distribution system right there. The other configuration, if you look on top of the pole and you see less than three wires, that's a single phase. But the, one of the wires would be the neutral that's going back to ground. The other one will be the hot primary distribution voltage. So if it's on top of the pole, those wires are primary. You treat them all with respect, right? Now, sometimes people hear explosions. You've got some wind blowing. You've got some things going on. You got some, maybe you've got some squirrels running around. And you hear an explosion. We get calls all the time. Oh, my transformer exploded. Oh, my God. No, we got to stop. Oh, please come out. The power went out. We just heard an explosion. What happened typically is something got up into the primary or got in something downstream of, and we blew a fuse. Something blew the fuse. It's just like you got a fuse panel at home to protect your equipment. We have fuses to protect our stuff. That's expensive to repair and time consuming. So we protect them with fuses. You hear an explosion. That's probably, your power went out, that's probably what went. It's probably a fuse. I just wanted to explain what that is. So here's the typical flow. It comes down from the primary, taps, goes over this side, comes through the fuse, comes out here. And in this case, I'm feeding three-phase primary down a riser to probably an industrial customer that needs three-phase primary. So the other way you might see primary as on the ground. And if you notice, we, you, you look around and we've got a lot of underground stuff. This is a metal box. This metal box is not bolted to that pad right there. If you backed into it, you hit it with your snow plow or you hit it with something, it's going to slide. It's going to move. And this thing has energized. This has a primary coming into this elbow underground. And it originated off the of street where there was three phase probably. It went underground. 
and it goes down through a riser and comes down and pops up and goes in right here. And it goes in, feeds this transformer in the back, there's oil fill transformer in the back, and there I can get that's a hot leg there, a hot leg there, hot, and that's a neutral. The two, yeah. So I can feed four houses 200 amp service off of this one transformer by feeding everything underground. But I got a big neighborhood, I got more customers, so I can I have to feed the primary voltage through, and that's this elbow right here. It goes underground, runs down the street, pops up at the next box, and 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 feeds that. Now, what you need to do if you hit this, if you hit this box, and you cannot move your vehicle, if you can move your vehicle, move your vehicle back 20, 30 feet, and call the utility, call 911, and keep people away from that. If you cannot move your vehicle and you're remaining in contact with this box. You have to assume that something is going wrong, that box is going to be electrified, and you've got to do some very important steps. And you've got to do this yourself and teach your family how to do this. You stay in the vehicle. If your vehicle's energized, that thing could be fully energized, and everybody inside, you'll not know it until it's too late when you try to step out. You do not want to get out of the vehicle. You call 911, you keep everybody in the vehicle, and don't let anybody approach the vehicle and keep it ready away until the utility is there to tell you it's safe to get out. It's not safe to get out. So that's very critical. We'll talk more about that. Here's a typical. This is a complicated poll, but this is typical. If you notice, you got your, your primary phase conductor, your primary conductors up here on top of the pole, and they're being held off the cross arm by this insulator. Now, this insulator has got to keep that conductor from touching the wooden cross arm. If, for some reason, there was a car versus pole hit, and that insulator failed and it dropped that conductor onto the wooden cross arm, that cross arm is going to become energized. The pole is going to become energized. And if, 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 if somebody look around and say, oh, all the wires are still up in the air. It's safe. You can get out now. You can touch the pole. You can walk around on the ground. It is a very dangerous situation. That's why if, if, if just like when you hit that recoil, the boxes on the ground, if you, you're in a car and you hit a pole, it is never safe to get out of that car until the utility is there to tell you it's safe because they're going to shut this thing off. They're going to make sure it's safe for everybody to do that, and they're going to observe things like that, things that a, someone who's not trained is not going to pick up on. So a little farther down the pole, we've got a device right here called a recloser. You guys need to understand what a recloser does. If I had a tree that fell down the street and it landed up against one of these phases of, of, of primary, could that tree conduct electricity from that phase of through the tree down to the ground, absolutely. That tree is full of sap, it's full of water, it's going to conduct a lot of electricity. And that's called a phase to ground fault. The recloser is designed to try to keep your lights on, believe it or not. Now, it senses that there's a problem, so it's going to open up before it burns something down. And then it's going to wait, it's going to time out. Typically, an hour's or, or have a 30 second wait period. It's going to say, maybe I can clear this fault. And it, maybe it's just a little squirrel up there. And, and we close back in. Boom, hit it with primary voltage. We can clear a lot of limbs, a lot of trees, a lot of squirrels with 23,000 volts. If the second shot doesn't clear it, it opens up again. Your lights just went out the second time. And now it's going to wait. It's going to wait 30 seconds. Say, I'm going to give it one more shot to try to clear this problem and keep the customer's lights on. Boom, it closes back in. Your lights came back on. It's trying to burn off or clear whatever the issue is. If it cannot clear the fault, it'll open up that third time. These things are designed what we call three shots for lockout. So if your lights go on and off, on and off, on and off, that's a recloser doing that to you. Now, the important thing to understand about that, if you've got wire down on the road and you see and you, you look at that and it's just sitting there and it's burning and it's burning and it's burning and it's not going out, the recloser is not seeing enough fault current to cause that thing to trip. That's simply all that's going on. It thinks maybe somebody turned on a washer and a dryer and there's a little bit of extra load, but it does not see enough fault current to trip. So if the wire goes out, it's going to try to come back in eventually. So you never trust any wire until the utility person is there, and they're going to take care of it. You, nothing you can do about it, nothing you can do to handle it. Now, below the recloser, there's your primary voltage up on the top. That's the primary zone. Down below the devices, all of our devices that connect to primary are above what we, the secondary. The secondary is always the same, two legs of 120, and that's where the neutrals are. And we're going to make it a little more complicated. Here's our three-phase primary up there. I've got a bank of three transformers. When you see a bank of three transformers, we're making 277, 480. And there's your secondary. Below that is phone and cable. Phone and cable has electricity in it. There's nothing on that pole that's not electrified. 
Bowman Cable in Connecticut, by law, cannot go any higher than 90 volts and 15 amps. And you have to assume everybody who's got internet, if they got phone and cable, you see that stuff on the pole, you've got to treat this with respect because everything's electrical. 90 volt, 15 amps, and it's DC. Everything secondary and primary is AC. Now, I had Shy Bird. It's actually sitting behind this green box right there. And I whistled at him, and I couldn't get him to smile at me, so I called him Shy Bird. And I said, I'm just showing him sitting on a piece of copper because people ask me all the time when I do presentations, well, Warren, how, how can a bird sit on a wire and not die? Well, there's no flow. There's no place for the electricity to go. Yes, there's electricity going through the, through the bird. He's at the same potential, but there's no flow to a different potential or to ground. So it's just sitting up there. But if another bird landed in the middle phase right here and said, hey, you're looking kind of, you're kind of cute there, shy bird. So how about a little peck on the cheek? And if I had two birds on two different phases touch each other, it's going to be a little fireball, and we're going to have, you know, there's, there'll be lots on the ground there. It's going to hurt. So sometimes a lot of outages are caused by critters that are running around up on these, on these phases, making phase-to-phase -phase or phase-to-ground contact. Our biggest arch nemesis during blue sky days are critters. Uh, particularly squirrels. So for overhead primary, the standard OSHA rule is if you're not trained, you're not qualified, you do not get within 10 feet. You get within 10 feet of that primary, the stuff can start arcing over to you, and you're, you've got a high probability of dying. And the linemen have a, have a, have a saying, it's a, a death by primary is going to be closed casket, and death by secondary is going to be open casket. So the reason is the amount of damage is, is going to take. What do you think kills more first responders and homeowners every year? That 23,000 stuff, that stuff that's on top of the pole up in the insulators, or the secondary that comes over and runs to your house right there? That secondary is what kills more homeowners every year. You have got to respect that secondary as a potential electrical hazard just as much as you do that primary and probably more. This could be hanging as low as 12 feet off the ground, coming over to your house. You should take your kids, you take your wife, take your dog, your mother-in-law, debatable, uh, outside, and at the end, it, to talk to them and tell them, if you ever see these secondaries down in the yard, down across the chain link fence, down across any the car in the driveway, any of that stuff, get back in the house, get everybody in the house safely and call 911, because if anybody steps on that secondary, it could be a, it could be a fatality, all right? This is where it attaches, your secondary attaches to your house. There it is coming over. The neutral, the bare neutral, is tied off through a wedge to an insulator so it doesn't have a path to ground through your house. The insulator insulates that. Here's your two hot legs. Your hot legs are coming in at 120, 120 volt. They go through your weather head and they go down to your service panel. So think of it like this. I've got two hot legs of 120 coming in. They're the same phase. I can take it into the house, turn it into 240 for the dryer, for the well, for those things that need 240. But most of your house runs off one side or the other. If you ever have flickering lights, so the wind blows and it's blowing around a little bit, you've got flickering lights, you have a problem with either a neutral or one of your hot lights. You call your utility immediately and tell them you have flickering lights. And you get somebody out there to check that out immediately. Your neutral is the return back to ground. You remember when we first started out, you've got to have a return to ground in order for the circuits to work, in order for electricity to flow. And electricity will find a path to ground but we want to give it a preferred path to ground, and that's the neutral. So it's going back out to the pole, connecting to other neutrals, and it's always going back to the ground safely, back at the substation typically. Right? Here, if you're going to do any work on your house, you're going to do anything, any painting, any guttering, anything like that, we want you to be able to do it safely. Every utility offers a free service if you call a week or two in advance, and they will cover your secondary service. You can get up there and do the paint, the poo, the gutter, and do these things safely. So if you touch the contact, you make contact with that secondary, you're not going to get hurt. And if you notice Jeff here, um, when I took this picture, he said, make sure you get my best side, so I promised him I did. He's, he's on a fiberglass ladder. Fiberglass ladders are the preferred device for getting around anything electrical. Aluminum is just a very, very bad thing to be around any electricity. So all, if you look at any electrician or any or utility people, they're always using fiberglass ladders. So let us come out, we'll service that and cover that up. Now if you notice the secondary always comes through the trees. Most utilities do not trim for the secondary and your tree limbs. You've got to do that yourself. So if you're going to do that yourself, you can typically call the utility and say, I need my power shut off from like 8 to 4 
on Saturday morning. I got a tree person coming on and trim all of that stuff away because if you get a tree rubbing against some of these wires, they can wear that out. They can cause those issues of the flickering lights, the bad neutral, the things you don't want to happen. So take a look at your secondary. Just run it through the limbs. Think about following up the utility and finding a qualified tree person to, to trim that back for you. And if you're going to get it close to your house, have them come out and cover your service for you. Storms. Now we're finally talking about the aftermath, the storms. Now, and you can look down the street. You can see down here that I had a tree that came down, and it's got people trying to start to do some cleanup. And I got a broken pole down here. I got a transformer on the ground. Now, I, I need you to think about this. They, they, if you have a transformer, there's only two ways to use this thing safely. You either plug this thing into your, you run a bunch of extension cords off the thing, and you run everything off an extension cord directly off your generator, or you use a 240 plug through a code-approved disconnect switch that is going to prevent you from backfeeding into the grid. And unfortunately, what we're finding more and more during storms is people drag this generator out, they don't read the safety manual, they don't have a code-approved switch, and they're plugging that 240 plug into the dryer outlet, and they're backfeeding their entire house. They think they can just go down and open the main, or they even don't forget to open the main, the main breaker, which is disconnects the two hot lights from the street, but there's no interconnect on that. And they can backfeed through their secondary to that transformer that's on the ground, and maybe the power's been out for a week. And somebody just got home with the generator, first generator they ever owned, plugged that in, didn't read the book, didn't do it properly. They could inadvertently cause that, sec that, 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 that transformer, who's supposed to step the primary down to secondary, they're taking the secondary, and they're, they're, they're inducing, they're, they're creating primary voltage and all that down primary that's been in the street last four or five days. And if somebody's walking down the street and the kids are playing on it, riding a bike, they're gone. They're history. They're toast. So that's why it's so critical that you, you use these generators safely and properly, and you've got a code to prove disconnect switch so you can't backfeed into the grid because you can kill people with these things. And we find, unfortunately, we find more and more of these occurrences happening. Two ways you die from electricity, you touch it. I got a car that has hit a pole. Hit a pole, and up on top of the pole, that insulator got, it got damaged, and the, and the conductor is laying on that cross arm. And that cross arm is now energized with primary voltage. The pole is energized with primary voltage. The pole is six feet in the ground. I got a beautiful path to ground, and the car is touching the pole. Now that whole car is energized. The car could be fully energized to 23,000 volts. The electricity is going through the body, through the frame, through the chassis, going to ground through the tires, and it's called a Faraday cage effect. The people in the car are not being electrocuted. There's no arc. There's no spark. There's nothing to warn you this stuff is going on. If you ran up and touched that car as a person on the outside, remember, I told you in the very beginning, it will always take the human being. All that electricity going through that car, fighting its way to the ground, is going to go through you, and you will die if you touch that vehicle. That's why you don't trust any situation, whether it's electricity and poles, until the utility is there to tell you it's safe. You can go up and help. You can go up and rescue. The other thing that may get you before you even got to that car is the step potential, the thing that's on the very top there. Now, as you, as you, if you can imagine that the base of that pole, I got 23,000 volts, and it's radiating away from the base of that pole and the voltage drops off and drops off and drops off with distance. If you start walking through that, you could very easily have a foot, one foot that's on a higher voltage than the other foot. It's always going to take the path of least resistance through water. It's going to be up your foot, up the leg, through your body, back to a lower voltage at the back leg. And if that ever is happening, this is step potential. You get two warning signs. One could be a light tingle and the large muscle in the upper thigh, similar to that 9-volt battery all men put on their tongue to test the 9-volt battery. That's what we do. That's genetically encoded that we do things like that. Women don't have that, but that's what it feels like. If you get a little bit more, that muscle in the upper thigh will twitch, and actually twitch. And if you feel that twitch, you're very, very close to dying from step potential. You've got to do something immediately. You've got to get your feet together. If there's other people in the room, you yell, hey, everybody, get your feet together. I felt electricity in the ground. Get your feet together. And once you get your feet together, you're like that shy bird on, on that primary. There's no flow. That's what you want to be. You want to be like Scheiber. Get those feet together. And, oh, now how we got to get out of this? We don't stand here until the CLT or UI or whoever shows up. If the utility shows up, we got to get out of this so we can start shuffling. We just got to keep going. Feet don't have to touch. We can shuffle or hop. I'm over 50. I don't hop anymore. But shuffle I can do. And I shuffle, 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 keep my feet together, same potential, back up 20, 30 feet, keep people away from it, tell the utility when 
when, when they come up that there, there appear to be step potential. It could be a guardrail, could be a guide wire, could be a pole, could be a car, could be a damaged pad mount transformer, could be a hundred different things. But you recognize this before you die. That's the important thing. I've got a, this is a legitimate picture. This is an actual scene from an accident where somehow there's primary that got on top of that vehicle right there. That whole truck is energized. And if you look at the tires, there's steam coming off where the, where the tires, there's electricity going to ground through all the tires coming through the trailer hitch, going to ground through these two tires. The best path to ground is right there. So that's a very dangerous situation for anybody that's coming from the outside. They're going to come up. They've got touch potential and they've got step potential. The people in the vehicle are not being electrocuted because of the Faraday cage effect. So they could be moving around. They could be using cell phones, radios, anything. But they don't want to step out of the vehicle and touch the ground because that's going to be that path of least resistance. It's going to fault all of that stuff to ground. So people always say, well, what if the vehicle catches on fire? What do we do? All right, that's, that's a good question. That happens. This is how you do it. If I came, if I'm in the vehicle and I open that door right there, I'm still in the vehicle. There's no flow, right? We got to jump. Everybody understands. We got to jump. We got to jump clear of the vehicle, not 10, 20, 30 feet. We don't need to do set Olympic records. We just need to jump clear of the vehicle. This could be a minivan. It could be a personal car. It could be a truck. It could be a dump truck. A dozer. Doesn't matter. We have to jump clear of that vehicle and be able to get away. To avoid step potential, we shuffle or hop. But first, we got to get out of the vehicle and land. So I teach people. Cross your arms, grab your shirt, grab your jacket, and when you jump, just jump clear of the vehicle. That's all you got to do. And then once you land, then you start shuffling. And people say, well, Warren, how far do we have to shuffle? I said, always pass the people watching you. So that's my rule. Once you pass people and they go, wow, look at that guy shuffle, yeah, it's probably safe to stop and go to and, and to take a breather. All right? But you don't want to do that unless it's a life and death situation because that's very, very dangerous. If you tripped and you fell into the door of the vehicle or your car door, and you're standing on the ground when you do that, bad things are going to happen. So the safest thing is always stay in the vehicle. Teach your, teach your family to do that, right? Stay in the vehicle. Now that we talked about some things, you know, maybe a couple of months ago you would have said, oh, what a quaint winter scene. But now let's look at this differently. Let's look at it from an electrical standpoint. There's a, could, this, could the guardrail be energized? Well, I don't know. Yeah, oh, yeah, okay, look. Yeah, look up there, all the primary, three-phase primary got ripped down. That tree could be laying on some of that primary, and it looks like some of the primary is down there. That tree could be easily energized, and that tree is touching the guardrail. That guardrail could be energized to touch and step potential just through that contact right there. So, and I asked people, I said, well, how, where, 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 would, where would you block the road? Should this road be blocked off? They said, absolutely. Where should it be blocked off? And at the end of the guardrails, the stuff will go through the guardrail as long as there's a guardrail. And that's the part you got to you got to recognize all these electrical hazards that are just waiting to eat you up if you don't know what you're doing. But now you're going to get smart. You're smarter than you were 20 minutes ago. Just to show you something, remember that recloser I talked about? It went three shots and locked out. That's all. It, it, that doesn't go quick. That takes a little time. That's how far it melted into that guardrail I beam post, steel I beam. And for a period of time, that whole guardrail from up the stop sign down to the sign that said that that was energized to 23,000 volts. Was there any step potential and, 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 and touch potential? You bet there was. There's a huge amount in that. The part that's concerned me, because this happened around the corner from where I live, by the time I got there, the fire police had arrived. They had flagged that off. They had tied this flagging tape, and that's where they put the other piece. They put it over there. So fortunately, fortunately for him, that recloser had already tripped the wires. And I asked him, how did you know it was safe? How did you know that recloser had already shut the power off? And he goes, what recloser? So uh, we had to do a little training, and that was a very close call. We could have lost a fire police volunteer with that one. He'd have been a little quicker. Something else, I don't want you to be a, a, a injured being trying to be a good Samaritan. This, is, this was in California, parking down the street, car versus pole. Car versus pole, knocked the pole off, blew the pole up, dropped some primary into the street. Then they hit a, a, the fire hydrant and flooded the street. Two good Samaritans got out of their car and went running into the water to help the people that hit in the car that hit everything, as soon as they hit that water, the primary was in it, they died. Seven other people were seriously burned and injured trying to rescue the two good Samaritans, the two ladies that were already dead in the water. The only people that survived without damage were the ones who stayed in their vehicle. That's what you've got to be able to do. 
You want if you're in the victim, you're in the vehicle, stay in the vehicle. That's the safest place to be. If you're a good Samaritan, recognize the situation, keep people away. There's nothing you could do except get yourself hurt. So recognize these things. Now, the effects of electrical shock. I'm gonna this very simple. I just want I'll start at the bottom. You're typically when you're using an extension cord, you're using something in your house outside in the yard, in the basement, in the garage. If you're working off of an outlet that's down there, you got to make sure you, you've got some protection. Think about what's covering you in a typical home breaker, circuit breaker, is a 15,000 milliamp, 15 amp circuit breaker. You've got to move more than, you have fault current more than 15,000 to blow it. This is what you want. You don't, that's not going to save your life. That's going to save your refrigerator. This is going to save your life. It's called a GFCI. A ground fault circuit donator will trip at less than five milliamps. And that's going to protect you. That's going to keep you alive. So when you plug into something, think about what's covering your back. Are you being covered by 15,000 milliamps or are you covered by five? Because if you're covering 15, you're dead at 10. So there's no life, there's no life saving there. You got to think about that. What's covering my back? And this is what you got to have. You want to have a ground fault circuit interrupter. Several different ways you can do it. All of these trip at less than five milliamp. It could be a receptacle like that. It could be a one you could get added into your circuit panel to protect the whole circuit. Or it could be a portable one like these. Like for 10 bucks right there. For 10 bucks, you could have that portable thing. You plug that into your 15,000 milliamp circuit for your, your outlet, and you plug your extension cord into that. That's going to save your life if there's a problem. So that's what you've got to do. Think about that. Worry about that. Inspect your extension cords. If you've got broken extension cords, past extension cords, if you've got something past your extension cord with electrical tape or duct tape, those are called widow makers for a reason. Get rid of them. Get some good quality, undamaged cords, and use GFCIs. These will keep you alive, I promise you. This is why men invented GFCIs. We're not the brightest. <laughs> okay? This is the, uh, think about this. I got Larry Moe and Curly over here having a, a pool party. They got a metal table in the middle of the pool with the George Foreman that needs power. The Foreman comes down, goes underwater into the floating sandal power strip holder, which they designed. They're very proud of that. And then the cord for that goes underwater and comes up to the floating block of wood with a duct tape to it that in case that falls in the water, it'll float. The only thing that's going to keep these, these, these guys and this, this act of stupidity alive is a $10 GFCI. That would keep these guys alive. Without that, they're good as dead. Maybe the loss of Darwin may, have, may apply on this case. But this is the stuff, that, this is why we invented GFCIs. They'll use them, they'll save your life, I promise. Talk about aluminum ladders uh, earlier. I just wanted to point out to you that the, the difference. This was a fatality. A gentleman came out of his garage with his secondary with his ladder, aluminum ladder that is hanging. They remember the secondary can hang as low as 12 feet off the ground. He walked around the corner of his house and he hit his secondary with his aluminum ladder. That aluminum ladder conducted electricity down, went through him, path of least resistance through his hands, through his body, and. It exited. It didn't go out his feet. He had on some shoes and some resistance. That's the exit wound just above his ankle that arced down the ground. That's how his family found him. Laying in the front yard, that's the only exit wound with his ladder. Does not have to happen. Does not have to happen. Pay attention to this. this. Get rid of the aluminum ladders. Get some fiberglass ladders and pay attention to your secondary. A secondary, even up in the air, can still kill you. So pay attention to that stuff. Take care of yourself and your family. So. I'm very close to wrapping up here. My last slide almost is stay alive, stay in the vehicle. That's the best thing to do right there. Call 911. Tell bystanders to stay back. Stay in the vehicle until the utility is there to tell you it's safe. And never trust any wire, primary or secondary, to be safe until the utility rep tells you it is. And you can see right there, I've got a vehicle that's gone in underneath the meter. That vehicle is energized to secondary voltage. That is what, that is still, I stay in the car, call 911. Don't let anybody touch that car. The only advantage of that, second, that, that, that vehicle in that picture to the right there under the meter is that the victim will look, it will be a clo open casket funeral. The one in the upper left will be, could possibly be a closed casket funeral. Could, you can see the primary that's supposed to be on top of that pole is missing. It's on the ground. You don't want to get out of the car. You don't want to approach that car. You don't know where that primary is. That's the kind of stuff you guys, I hope, now that we're through, had a little education, you're a little smarter. And it's not gonna, you're not going to let it happen to you or your family. So I hope you enjoyed that. So, Michelle? I'd say we did. I, I think if we could give a standing O on a webinar, uh, we, <laughs> we would do it. <laughs> Thank you so much, Warren. Really, um, 
you know, it's, it's great information. This is a life changer. There are good webinars, and then there's one like this. And, um, you know, I, I really appreciate, we all really appreciate you sharing your expertise with us. Great, great info. Oh, thank you. Uh, we've gotten several good questions. Uh, we will stay on the line for anybody who'd like to participate in a Q&A, but I do want to quickly note the time since that will take us over our original 35-minute estimate. If anybody needs to drop off, that's okay. Um, you know, we will have a recorded version of this available for you. If you want to ask a question and you haven't yet done that, you can do it using your webinar control panel, so that's an option for you too. We've got several, so yours, yours might be in the list already, but we'll go ahead and get started with those. First one is, um, if we decide to evacuate, should we turn off all the power in our house? Uh, I, I don't know that that's actually going to do you any good. I, I don't think that um, if, if the power goes out due to whatever the cause of the the, the, the evacuation is, um, I, I don't. I, it's, it's a fifty-fifty thing. If you prefer, if you want to do that, if you want to open up your main breaker, you could do that. There's possibly. I can see that they might prevent some type of surge into the house. Um, I've never read anything that that's a preferred thing to do. I'm not saying it's not a good thing to do. I just, I've never heard of anything on that. But if you're going to do that as you evacuate, do it at the main breaker. Yeah. Okay, yeah, that's a good idea. I, I think I would be worried about the refrigerator and coming back to that house. <laughs> so as long <laughs> as there's not, you know, a, a really strong reason to do it, that's that's good to know. Yeah. Um, Second question about Shybird, our good friend Shybird. Why does the Shybird survive? What if I touch a wire with two hands? And my hands are touching. Uh, so if, let me see. If that, are we talking about maybe somebody just hanging off of the the wire? I don't know. I guess let's yeah. say um, hand, hands touching each other, just like Shybird's feet are touching each other. In theory, and I'm going to qualify that. In theory, if I was hanging off that wire, I would be, I would be alive. If there was some way I could hang off that wire, and I'm not touching, there's no flow through me to any other potential or into ground. In theory, uh, you should be okay until until something else touches you, um, which is something that's interesting. We we did some work with uh, the Balloon Society. The Balloon Society, we're we're doing some stuff. We have video where the balloon is hanging underneath some wires. They're, they are tied up in, uh, they're actually the balloons collapsed over some wires. And the people in the balloon were fine until somebody reached out and grabbed one of the wires out of the balloon. And that gave a path to ground from one potential mm -hmm. to the next. So in theory, in the perfect world with no other issues, if you were just hanging off one phase of primary with no other path to ground, why would you want to do that? I don't know. But in theory, that wouldn't, that would, I don't want to say survive, but that would be, you might have, you'd be on, you might be okay. Okay. I think it's safe to say never a good idea. <laughs> no, no, not a good plan, no. Never a good plan. Okay. Um, this is a good one. Why don't they teach this stuff to kids in school? I think a lot of this was new information to probably a lot of people on the call, certainly for me. So. There's uh, a lot of utilities do have school programs. I know in, in Connecticut Light and Power we do. We, we'll do 30 to 40,000 kids. Usually we target the fourth and fifth graders. Um, but if you want to do something and, and you want your kids to have something to watch, we put a one on our CLMP. Go to CLMP.com and go to safety and we have videos. And we have some on, on, on one specifically about the, for kids. Uh, it's called uh, Safe Not Sorry. And then we have uh, one for more of an older group called uh, and first responders. And then there's one for generator safety. And there's other ones on there about step potential and storm cleanup, all available online, clmp.com. So please consider that a resource. Um, but a lot of, we do a lot of school education. Good. Thanks for that. Um, are there any other safety features I should consider getting for my home or for my car? Mm, for your car, no. Uh, for your home, I, I, if you get a qualified electrician, especially if you have a, an older home, I, I would suggest you also, when you get the electrician to come in and take a look at your panel and everything, ask him about AFCI. Called, they're called arc fault circuit interrupters. AFCIs, so most home fires old and older homes, and I thought once that is like over 40,000 a year, are caused by the wire that's inside your walls in your home, 
where the insulation breaks down or a critter or something over time breaks down and you get the fire actually starts inside your wall due to this arcing from a wire that's inside the wall. This arc fault circuit interrupter, and a lot of states have made a code for all new, uh, for, for, for living spaces, for like all bedrooms. You can get this arc fault circuit interrupter, and a qualified electrician can put this thing in for you that'll snuff and prevent that uh, from happening, from that fire from starting in the living spaces due to bad wiring. Um, they're only about, uh, they're, they're pretty reasonable considering what the damage is and what the life, you know, save a life for 45, 50 bucks. Um, but that's the other thing. Besides GFCIs, I think AFCIs are, should be mandatory. Everybody should have those things, especially in an older home. Yeah, I think that might be code here where I am. I, I know we have those in our house. Uh, okay, next one says, I've heard that you should never walk in standing water because of the risk of electrical shock. Is that true? Walk, walk where? Uh, never walk in standing water. In standing, just standing water? Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Yeah, that's what it is. I, I've heard you should never uh, walk in standing water because of the risk of electrical shock. Uh, no, I, I've never heard that one. Um, electricity, obviously, like we like I showed in that earlier picture, if there's electricity around, it, 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 will, it will amplify, it will spread the danger area, that is definitely. Um, there was a fatality recently where there was a, a dock that had power that run out to the end of the dock, and part of the power the, the had dropped into the water, so the surface of the lake was electrified, and the guy saw his dog was in the water struggling. He dove into the water. He was electrocuted when he dove into the water um, from the secondary that was touching the, the water, and for some reason it didn't trip anything. So it, it, this is real. If I see standing water, I, it's not a concern, but there are there are conditions, down wires, um, obviously is going to be an issue, um, car versus poles, things like that. Just as a general rule, um, I tell you, I have a golden doodle, and she can't avoid standing water. Um, but uh, I, <laughs> I have a golden retriever, same thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so. Okay, um, let's see, this one is, sometimes you see lines down, and you can't tell if they're just cable TV or telephone lines. Should I call the police each time I see any kind of lines down? Yes. Yes. If you don't know what they are, you definitely need to call 911 and have somebody who does know what they are come out and take care of them for you. I, I'd, I'd rather, if you don't know what you're looking at, don't take the risk. Call 911 and get somebody out there that can't. We don't mind showing up and finding, oh, that's just phone and cable. At least nobody got hurt. That's the bottom line. Nobody got hurt. If you don't know, call an expert. Okay. I think that's a great note to end on. Warren, thank you so much for today. Um, as we wrap this up, I'd like to thank everybody who's attended and ask that you take the 20 seconds, 30 seconds to complete a survey that's going to pop up in just a moment when, when we conclude here. Doing that really helps us continue to provide you guys with productive, instructive webinars um, and, and shape the content for future programs. And if continuity housing can help your organization by guaranteeing hotel housing for your critical personnel on a contingency basis, please let us know that as well. Thanks again, Warren. For Warren Rogers and Continuity Housing, I'm Michelle Lowther. Hope everyone has a wonderful weekend.